Articles made of iron can be seen almost everywhere in the world. Many of these, for example, this cooker hot plate, have been given their final shape by the method of casting. What sort of work goes on when small articles are cast? To see what actually takes place, we must visit a foundry. Here we are then, in an iron foundry, and this is a trolley of small castings ready for weighing and inspection. Included are some cooker hot plates. We're going to follow the processes used in making these hot plates until they're ready for enamelling. First of all, we must go along to the pattern shop. The pattern maker makes a model or pattern of the cooker hot plate. He works from drawings done by a draftsman or designer. In this case, he's using an alloy of lead and tin. He may also use wood or plaster of Paris, but whatever material he shapes, he must be accurate. For a fault in a pattern, if undiscovered, would be reproduced in all the castings made from it. A final inspection, and he's satisfied. Before we leave the pattern shop, however, he will give us a general idea of how the pattern is to be used. This black substance that he's scraping level is known as moulding or floor sand. It is sand mixed with small quantities of clay and coal dust. He picks up the pattern, places it on the sand, and presses it down firmly. Pick it up again. Careful. Don't spoil it. Now, dust some white parking powder on so that we shall be able to see the impression quite clearly. If onto this impression molten iron were poured and then allowed to cool, the result would be somewhat similar in shape to the pattern. The next actual stage is preparing the mould. Pattern plates to make two cooker hot plates are being used. This man is smoothing floor sand to make a firm bed for an iron box which contains a pattern plate. The top half of the box has already been packed with sand. Onto the pattern plate, first, parting powder is dusted. This prevents sand from sticking to the pattern when it is removed later. The foundry man is a neat worker. He always puts down his tools where he can easily pick them up again. Next comes finely sieved facing sand. This prevents coarse sand from causing lumps or hollows in the casting. Ordinary moulding sand is now shoveled into the box and is carefully tucked in by hand. This makes the sand fit closely to the pattern plate. Moulders have sensitive, skillful fingers. The box is topped up with more floor sand. Ramming follows. The sand, owing to its clay content, will now be firm enough to withstand the weight of the hot metal. A final stamp down all over. Did you notice the man's boots? They're made to keep out the sand and to protect him from any splashes of molten metal. The box is leveled off. Holes are made in the sand, in this case two for each hot plate, so that later molten iron can be poured in. These holes are carefully smoothed off so that no loose sand remains. The top half of the box, complete with sand, is now taken off, leaving the pattern plate on the lower half. This plate is brushed, capped to loosen it, and then carefully removed and placed on the half of another box, ready for making the next mould. The inside ends of the holes are cleaned so that the molten metal will run down freely. Packed tight in the box, moulding sand keeps its shape in both halves. Any loose sand is blown away with hand bellows. 
the top half of the box is replaced. Within this box now is a space left by the pattern plate we've just seen removed. The space is connected to the outside of the box by the holes. The mould is finished. Meanwhile, furnace men are busy melting the iron. Here is the lander or trough leading from the tap hole in the bottom part of a cupular furnace. Into the furnace are charged coke, limestone, big iron, and scrap iron. This is the upper part of a cupular furnace. The furnace man throws in the materials through the charging doors. They fall down into the lower part. That was the coal. Here is the limestone. It's followed by pig iron from the blast furnace. Finally, the scrap iron. Each load of iron is weighed so that the right amounts are used. When the furnace is fully charged, a blast of air is blown in at the bottom. And, in due course, the metal melts. Down again now to see the tapping. A hole is forced through the furnace lining. White hot molten iron flows out into a bogey placed under the lander. The furnace man is not quite satisfied that the hole is big enough, so he is going to enlarge it. Ah, that's better. Now the molten iron is flowing out more freely. Its temperature is about 1,450 degrees centigrade. The bogey of liquid iron is now wheeled away to the foundry floor where we left the boxes. Pouring the molten metal into the mould can now begin. Along the foundry floor comes the bogey. From it, hand shanks or ladles are filled. Each hand shank takes up to 50 pounds of molten metal. The pourers often work in pairs. This man is waiting for his mate to have his hand shank filled. Notice how he protects his face from the heat and glare. Now, ready, there is cooker hot plate number one. And there's the second. Down the holes goes the molten metal, running in to fill the space in the sand once occupied by the pattern plate. Skillful men, these borers, molten iron isn't the stuff to spill. Now, while we watch for a few minutes, the metal changes. From a liquid, brilliantly white hot, it becomes a solid, dull and grey. But it is not cool yet. So, in opening the boxes, the man takes care not to touch the castings. The two halves of the box are removed. And here, in each black and steaming heap of sand, are two newly made cooker plates. The metal that's set in the holes is, of course, still part of these castings. It looks a little like the end of a golf club. Now it must be removed. Quite an easy job because the iron joining it to the plate is very thin. Notice that he knocks inwards each time. This is to prevent damage to the plate itself. Cast iron is brittle. Watch. Inwards. Later, the parts knocked off will be used for scrap and remelted in the furnace. Only finishing, or fettling as they call it in the foundry, now remains to be done. First, to get rid of the sand. One way is to use a stiff wire brush. 
But however carefully a mould is prepared, there is always a certain amount of roughness on the casting. Some of this roughness is removed by an abrasive wheel. This man is taking off the ridge round the edge of the casting. It was formed between the top and bottom sections of the mould. And here's the result. The ridge has been smoothed down. At the beginning, in the pattern shop, we saw work being done by hand. And now, at the end, in the fettling shop, we again see work being done by hand. He is trimming up a cooker plate with a file. Other cooker parts on the bench at the back are also at their finishing stages. As batches of cooker plates are finished and ready for enamelling, they are removed on a trolley for weighing and inspection. We have followed the processes used in making these small castings. First there was a drawing and then a pattern. Pattern, sand and box in two halves made a mould. Iron was melted, it was poured into the mould, it set and the plate was taken out of the sand and made smooth. And so the finished article, like thousands of others cast in iron, finds its way into everyday use.